of the Calgary Prophetic Bible Institute. This is really not our regular program from the Bible Institute today. We have moved down to the grandstand in the exhibition ground so that the friends and citizens of Calgary and district could meet together in a great monster Thanksgiving service on the occasion of our first anniversary of the social credit victory at the polls. Just one year ago today, yesterday, the people of this great province of Alberta declared by ballot rather than by bullet that they were determined to have economic freedom. Today we have met to give God the glory. With heartfelt praise and devotion, we want to acknowledge his mercy and his goodness to us. We have here in the grandstand and all around us thousands of people. I would judge that the people assembled here this afternoon are ready to acknowledge our indebtedness to Almighty God, to Jesus Christ, for his grace and goodness to us. We have loud speakers all around the platform, and I trust the people are hearing me clearly. Yesterday afternoon, we had the largest picnic I ever attended at St. George's Island. Over 10,000 people, I judge, were present. It was an inspiring and enc encouraging sight. Prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that the people of Calgary and District have not lost their progressiveness in the matter of economic freedom. At the time of the election a year ago, we had about 4,000 people in the pavilion on August the 21st. But we never had a crowd of 10,000 people assembled together in Calgary on social credit occasions before today. I have here today the record of the registration for Calgary. I'm sure the folks of Calgary will be glad to hear it. Total number on the voters list in Calgary is 41,193. The number who voted for social credit in the provincial last election was 23,809. The number, the number up to the present that ever registered in this great move to introduce social credit is 30,475. <laughs> That's just 6,600 more than voted for social credit, and another month is yet to go for registrations, and they're pouring in continually. It appears to me, ladies and gentlemen, that the people of Alberta are more favorably minded to this great crusade today than they were a year ago. On, on one or two occasions this week, I have received reports that the registrations were over 100% of the voters' list. It would seem that some people, British subjects, have never voted before, but they're willing to cooperate. At first glance, I hardly understood how they could register over 100% of the voters' list. It reminded me of a, an old Irish ranch farmer who wired to the owner that he'd lost 125% of his cattle. <laughs> to make it plain, he said, 75% of his cows and 50% of his steers were killed. That made 125%. <laughs> Alberta citizens are pioneers in this great crusade movement to economic deliverance. The world has its eyes upon Alberta. They are praying that we may succeed. I see where William Perkins Bull, prominent Toronto lawyer, thinks that these prayers are without much faith. He thinks the world wants us to succeed, but it hasn't much hope that we will. It would be alarming to surprise the world, wouldn't it? As a citizen of the conservative Toronto, and coming from a man with the name Bull, we could expect no other opinion. surprise for us to find that the Herald had printed it. It sent it in. The 
Sorry, I, I, I'll have to ask you to refrain from tapping or we'll not get through the program. It fitted in with the general policy of the Calgary Herald, so it was published by this gradually decreasing family paper. By the way, from several sources I've heard that the circulation of the Herald has dropped off nearly 50%. How could you expect otherwise? People are getting tired of reading that upon which they cannot rely. What beats me is that the advertisers continue paying for space in a paper of steadily decreasing circulation. I suppose that it's their own business, that it's none of mine, and it's all right with me as long as they can spare the cash. I received a letter from High Prairie this week protesting vigorously about the newspaper report of August the 8th in the Edmonton Journal, which declared that Alberta prosperity certificates were being discounted 20% by the merchants in this northern town. The 21 workmen who received the $400 worth of prosperity certificates declared solemnly and seriously over their signatures that there is not a vestige of truth in the newspaper report, not a single vestige of it. Each one of them received goods to the full amount of the face value of the certificates from every merchant but one in High Prairie. People will surely get tired of paying for that kind of news. By the way, they tell me that the Herald is complaining because we do not give enough Bible in our afternoon broadcast. Thank you. That is one of the best times I've heard yet. You know, down east, in the environment of the financiers in my younger days, if we saw an old reprobate come to church and ask to be shown the scriptures, the preachers used to say, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. I do not mean that the word reprobate could be applied to the herd. I have read this week in the Vulcan paper where the herald is asserting most solemnly and sincerely the honesty of its purpose. So I must not apply any such derogatory terms to the herald. I do feel, however, that since they are asking for more Bible in our broadcast, that Saul has become one of the prophets. And the herald is not far from the kingdom of God. A little repentance will do it, herald. To emphasize further their desire in this matter, they have published an interview, I should say a probable interview, with a prominent Presbyterian minister from the eastern states who was much distressed that there was so little Bible in the two broadcasts that he heard while he was in Calgary. It's rather interesting to have preachers of the United States criticize the Bible teaching in Canada, isn't it? Have you ever attended the churches in the eastern states? If you have, you may understand what I mean. I'm objecting on the ground that once more the financial press brings in foreign opinion and influence to try to control us. To offset this so-called foreign opinion, let me say that I received this week three letters from faraway places. One from Los Angeles, California, the other from East Orange, New Jersey, and one from Toronto, Ontario. All three greatly interested and anxious that we should succeed. Our sister province of Saskatchewan is also becoming deeply interested. Major Saskatchewan writes this week, we are sorry to know that you still have in your province some few men who are so lacking in human sympathy that they would let the people go hungry and cold while they are trying to buck your efforts to distribute and purchasing power. I hope some of the Calgary citizens, city councils listen to this. <laughs> that may read on. Many of us in Saskatchewan are watching. We have little respect for anyone who is not willing to try at least to better the condition of people who are in want. We trust that our government will get busy and follow your example. Kerr Roberts, Saskatchewan says, We are watching your activities and only wish you were the Premier of Saskatchewan. We would surely appreciate you and your efforts. Nothing is being tried out here. Just the same old story, the same old routine. You can put over social credit in Alberta. It'll be no trouble to elect a social credit government in Saskatchewan next election. We've been in the habit of subscribing to the journal and reading the criticisms of you and your government, the obstacles that are being placed in your way. We feel sure that you will win out in spite of their efforts to stop you. We're discontinuing the journal today. Listen to this one from Lucelin, Saskatchewan. Mr. Eberhardt, dear sir, here is one firm that will take prosperity certificates for any of my line of goods. And I agree to cooperate by taking Alberta-made goods in return. Please answer on Sunday broadcast what provision you have made in this respect, as the following business places in Lucelan, Saskatchewan, are also ready to cooperate. One hardware store, one barbershop, one restaurant, one drug store, one gasoline store, and one general store. 
I'm sorry, Saskatchewan. We cannot at present make arrangements to encourage prosperity in your province. We appreciate the spirit of cooperation, and someday we may be able to help you. But it can't today. I'm satisfied, ladies and gentlemen, that the election in Manitoba and Quebec has shown the handwriting on the wall. Canadian people are getting tired of this prolonged, lazy, fair attitude on the part of the government. Something should be done. A great pioneer movement has begun in Alberta. Nothing can stop it. We haven't yet faced the difficulties that other pioneers have faced. We expect them at any moment. Columbus stood in his age as a pioneer of progress and achievement. Think of his setbacks. His perseverance never failed. When rejected at Genoa, rejected at Venice, rejected in Portugal, Portugal, delayed in England and delayed in Spain, yet he still persevered. It is true that we have been disappointed in the great Major Douglas, who failed to spring to the helm when opportunity offered itself. It is true that the federal government refused to save us from default on April the 1st class. It is a fact that some people have tried to put an injunction in our path in Edmonton to prevent us from helping the city to help the unemployed. But we are still sailing on. We're more fortunate than Columbus. Columbus was like Abraham. He went out not knowing whether he went. We feel we know where we're going to land. Columbus died in utter ignorance of the true nature of his discovery. He supposed that he had found India, but he never knew how strangely God had piloted him. He sailed for the back door of Asia, and he landed on the front door of America and knew it not. All pioneers, like Moses, endure as seeing him who is invisible. Only they who fix their eyes on the invisible one can reach the goal of their endeavor. God grants that today, in that bark of faith and trust, we may press on and on, knowing that we shall succeed if we faint not. We're on the way to a great discovery. The people of Alberta will be recognized the world over. I'm most anxious that our people may be worthy of the respect and admiration that shall surely be yours. You must bear the torch of practical Christianity to a sin-cursed world. That's your problem. That's your responsibility. There is a secret I want you to discover. Many great men have discovered it. The great surgeon, Sir James Simpson, the man who discovered chloroform, by which men could be relieved of much pain, was once approached by a young man who wished to compliment him and express his admiration for him. The young man accosted him thus, Sir James, what do you regard your greatest discovery? The simple reply of this eminent scientist came as a great surprise to the young man. My lad, my lad, said Sir James, my greatest discovery is that I am a great sinner and that Jesus Christ of Calvary is a great savior. You men and women are all good social creditors. You've made a real discovery that may help to revolutionize the world. But have you discovered the secret that Sir James Simpson had discovered? I have, and many others I know as well. But have you really discovered that we are, each one of us, a great sinner, and that Jesus Christ of Calvary is a great savior? You and I can never reach the highest success that God has for us until you have discovered that great secret. Please do not neglect it. May I now acknowledge to the radio friends the contributions for Sunday afternoon broadcast received this week. Airdrie Goldenrod Social Credit Group, Bellevue, Mrs. Goodwin, Big Valley, Old Zach, Social Credit Group, Camrose, Mr. Oliver Smith and family, and Mr. Norman Bunker. Standard C. Thorison, Proshu, John Radomsky, and the following from Calgary. 16th Street West, 1st Avenue Northeast, 29th Street Southwest, 18th Avenue West, no name, and 17th Avenue Northwest, 11th Avenue East, and another no name. I thank you one and all for what you have given us to us, and I appreciate the crowd giving me the opportunity of answering these letters, which is so difficult to answer otherwise. I should like our friends who are listening in at the Bible Institute this afternoon over the loudspeaker there, to know that I'm thinking of them just now. I hope you're hearing me clearly. I should like to slip in a moment and speak a word or two from the platform there, for that's my favorite place, and then come back here afterwards, but I guess I can't do more than just imagine I was there. I hope that next Sunday in the arena at Edmonton, we have equally as great a meeting. 
We want all social creditors of Edmonton there, and as many as possible from the neighboring districts. Come in like they did to cast the Calgary here, from all districts, driving with their cars and in buses, and let's have a real gathering in the center of the North Edmonton. I'm very delighted with Calgary's meeting, and I trust we shall have a similar one in Edmonton. This is our anniversary time. It should be one of jubilation and happy praise. May I ask our people to be careful not to brag or boast. We can be happy and much encouraged, but do not get the idea that man's ingenuity can accomplish much. Be happy, be joyous if you like, but always have a note of praise in your heart to the God of heaven. And now for the new year, leading to the second anniversary, here's a little advice for you in poetry. Speak a shade more kindly than the year before. Pray a little oftener, love a little more. Cling a little closer to the Father's love, thus shall life below grow more like the life of us. I trust we can do this. I told you last Sunday we were preparing for our fall work of the Radio Sunday School. Last year we had 5,340 students. Wherever I go, I meet them and how much it pleases me. To get a start on this work, we have to purchase the lesson leaves and the questionnaires. It is an expense, an initial expense, of a little over $2,000 to supply 5,000 students with their regular work. $2, Major Saskatchewan $5, Maple Creek Saskatchewan $2, River Bore $50, Wimburn $0.50, cents, and the following from Calgary, 20th Avenue Southeast $3, and No Name $1, a total $64.75. We really need $125 a Sunday to carry on this work. Thank you very much for your support. It has come to my notice that the Commissioner and Council of your fair city has, uh, has threatened that if we declare a dividend, uh, they will take it from the relief grant of those unfortunate people who need help. To me, that's a dreadful, that's dreadful, and shows a peculiar disposition, a cruelty of heart. There is but one answer to that question. It's up to the people of the city of Calgary to elect to the important council offices of their city those who really have a heart bigger than that. I am about finished. A number I have asked uh, questions about registration and citizenship. I would advise that you register as you are, giving full particulars if you have any doubt about it, and then have your form sent up to Edmonton for investigation. Too many of you do not give enough information for us to be able to give you a proper answer. We need a good speaker up here as soon as possible. This comes from Troshu to explain these registration forms as the opposition are misrepresenting them to anyone who will listen. And it's difficult for us social creditors to reach them all. A meeting what we, is what we urgently need and a good convincing speaker. Yes, Trosha, we'd be glad if we could accommodate you. Unfortunately, when people are so gullible to listen to everything they're told, it's impossible for us in a short space of time to cover the whole province. Here's a letter from Insign asking about the regi uh, uh, registration. My father was born in Canada and lived in the United States for a while, but did not take out naturalization papers there. I was born in the state. I've been living in Alberta for over 19 years. I also have a son born in the state. Would we be Canadian? Yes, sir, you would. Question from Ogden. Is a woman born in the United States and married to a Canadian before 1932 Eligible for registration. Yes, I think so. Should have your information fully, though, to know all about it. Here's one. Reading the form for dividends, it gave me to think we must work for the government and give 20% of our wages to the government before we can get dividends. Oh, I'm sorry, Ditsbury. Somebody's got you filled up properly, haven't they? May I repeat that social credit does not intend to take anything from anybody. You will not have to lose any of your salary or wages. All we ask you to do about the 
is to receive 20% of your wages, if possible, in Alberta Credit. That's all. And Alberta Credit will buy all Alberta goods. Can't buy goods that have to be imported, of course. Here's one from Hilo, Alberta. If a person signs up for social credit for the dividend, will a person lose his old age pension? No, I don't think they will. I think it couldn't be possible to be allowed. Please answer this over the air. When persons like me and lots more in the same position have a steady job and have a farm but no benefit out of the farm, only paying taxes on the farm, should we register on citizen covenant or producer's covenant or both? Register on both, sir. We want to know all about your case. Here's one from up the country that reads like this. I've had a few men to see me in connection with registration who tell me they know a number of citizens, including themselves, that would like very much to sign the registration forms and cooperate with the government, but they feel they may lose their jobs thereby. They said they would like to know what you would advise in a case of this kind and ask what their names or the names of the companies not be mentioned in any way. Listen, sir, your registration is to be perfectly secret. If you have any doubt about it, you go to your MLA and register and do it whatever way you like. There's no reason why any financial henchman should have any right to put you into distress because you want to cooperate with your fellow citizens. It's abominable, and we'll try and save you from any, any knowledge be given up. Here's one from Carlson. Please refer to Clause 4 of the government portion of the Citizens' Registration Covenant to redeem, when possible, Alberta credit with Canadian currency for the purpose of allowing the member to take up residence outside the province. Does this mean that an old resident of Alberta who, for reasons of climate and health, was compelled to reside, say, in British Columbia, could continue to receive the Alberta dividend for the time being. We can't promise you that just yet. We hope that in time that will be. We're very anxious that B.C. should become an economic unit with Alberta, and if such is the case, there would be no trouble to arrange it. This is a closing one. As you are in the habit of answering queries on Sunday afternoon, will you please, after reading the following, say if I am a bona fide citizen of Alberta? I'm a Britisher born, never lived outside the empire, ever am over 70 years of age, came to Canada from Britain 64 years ago, came west to Winnipeg in 97, came to Alberta 32 years ago, have brought hundreds of acres of virgin prairie under cultivation, have always up to the present paid 100 cents in the dollar, and as far as I know have kept the laws of the country. I've never earned enough to be income taxable, cannot get old age pensions. Have you not said on different occasions that all bona fide citizens of Alberta will be entitled to social credit by dividends if and when they're distributed? If the foregoing facts are established, can I and my wife and family under 21 get said dividends without signing the prescribed covenant? Well, sir, listen, I don't know why you don't want to put your name down on a piece of paper to say you want them. We cannot give you dividends without having your name on the books, you know. How in the world would you get them if your name wasn't on our books? And all we ask you to do is to sign that you want to cooperate with the rest. You know, when you deposit your money in the bank, if you ever did that, you'd have to sign also when you put it in the bank. Now that completes our correspondence for today. We're going to be, uh, have on the next on the program, a uh, hymn on your hymn sheet. I want you to stand while we're singing it. It's going to be dedicated to William Meikle John of Provo, Mr. Colshaw of Lockheed, and Mrs. Alcock of Calgary. What a friend we have in Jesus. Let's stand and sing a verse of this. station CFCN Voice of the Prairie, broadcasting the great monster Thanksgiving service held in the uh, grandstand of the exhibition ground. We hope you're listening and uh, hearing us clearly and that you're enjoying the program. Now I'm going to ask that Mr. Hutchison, our secretary, will make the, uh, uh, make the announcement for this afternoon. Well, yeah. Going to first of all, Call upon the ushers to receive your offering. 
Trusting that you make this as generous as possible this afternoon, defray the expenses in connection with this special service. You've counted on the social credit people before. We're counting on you again today. Ushers, will you come forward now and receive the offering? While the ushers are receiving your offering, I want to make a few special announcements. You to kindly bear them in mind. May I first of all make the announcement for the church services in Calgary? Another from Athabasca, Honorable William Eberhardt Calvert. Greetings to you, the cabinet, MLAs, and all on the first birthday. Away from the north of the Athabasca group. Here we thank all these folks for their very kind wish. Those are all the announcements for this afternoon. It would have done your heart good if you'd been with us way up in Colinton, eight miles south of Athabasca, this last week and seen the eagerness and the support that's given to us in that far northern country. The harvest is on in full blast, and the people turned out a thousand strong that afternoon in spite of the harvest being on. Here's a question that's been sent up to me. If a merchant deposited all his cash in the credit house, how will he meet his drafts when they are due? It would be the credit house that would meet his drafts, not the merchant. His cash would be there to meet them, just the same as the banks would meet them today. A lady, rumor, a lady rumor says friends of hers are not going to register owing to the fact that they were hailed out and had nothing to give. They no doubt have been misinformed. It's too bad that this misrepresentation and misinformation has been passed out for the purpose of deluding and deceiving many of the people who swallow everything they're told. We trust that people will once more realize what we have said so often before the election and since, social credit does not intend to take anything from anybody. You can never solve the problem by taking out of one pocket and putting it into the other. You must create new purchasing power, and that's what we intend to do. And as we are able to produce great quantities of supplies, so by the increase of our purchasing power, our people will be happy and contented. I trust the folks will not be deluded by these misrepresentations. Now, uh, <clears throat> I'm just wondering how many of this audience have come in from the surrounding district of Calgary. I don't mean from Edmonton now. I mean from the surrounding district of Calgary. Would you mind raising your hands, those that came in from outside points? That's very fine. There must have been at least 800 people raised their hands, I would judge, rapidly scanning the audience as they raised them. We're very glad to have you with us. We hope you enjoy the service. Now I have a little surprise for you. Listen, I have a little paper that I got recently that I think is rather a neat little cut. It's a picture of a farmer with a, uh, with a uh, shovel in his hand. He's been uh, harvesting or looking after his cabbages. At the bottom of this is the ca are the cabbages, and upon the cabbages are six bugs with tall hats. He's dying with quite a way, way, a sort of a sorrowful look on his face, and uh, the problem that he's facing is how is he to get rid of these bugs? Now listen, I wonder how many from the surrounding district of Calgary have come 200 miles. Will you raise your hand, please? Oh, my goodness. There's about 50 of you. How many have come 300 miles? Well, I wonder if one of you folks that have come 300 miles can find your way down. Mr. Glenn, will you where's Mr. Glenn? You run away, <laughs> Well, if you'll come down here, I'd like to give you a nice clean one. Mr. Manning, will you? Will you see that they get there, please? Will one of you come down? Those that were 300 miles, I'd just like you to take one way. I've autographed it for you, and I'd like you to have it just to keep it.
Where is he from? Very glad to have our American friends here. Come all that distance. We're delighted to have them. Come all that distance. We're delighted to have them here. <laughs> Give this man. Do you see other guys? Oh, that's fine. Give him one, too. Well, then give him this one. That's all I have. From India. From Calcutta, India. Well, it's... See how small the world is, isn't it? The world's eyes are on you folks. They're coming this way to see what you look like. They used to come to see what I look like until they found I had no hair. North of Edmonds. Yes, well, I haven't any more of those papers. I'm sorry, I'd like to give them. Are you going to be in Edmonton next week? Well, if you were, I'll try and get some. I think I'll have some of those printed, and we'll have them distributed. Which? Oh, yes, Mr. Havers. I'm glad to have Mr. Havers. Mr. Havers of Saskatoon is the man. You better come up here, Mr. Havers, so they can see you. He's the man that's trying to get Saskatchewan in order. And he's going over there from this crowd and get this enthusiasm. <laughs> to organize Saskatchewan. Manitoba is pretty nearly ready to be organized now. We've just had the Manitoba people here. They're going to go ahead organizing Saskatchewan about ready. And I believe we're going over to BC to get that ready. And the West will be social credit before many months. I think it's fitting that I should have on the platform with me this afternoon the young man that has been traveling with me all the time of the social credit propaganda work, Mr. Honorable Ernest C. Manning, Provincial Treasurer. I'm satisfied there isn't a man in this province can give you the reminiscences of the past like Mr. Manning can. So I'm going to ask him now to come to the, the uh, microphone and speak to you. Just pausing a minute, ladies and gentlemen, on the radio. Let the few friends that have to go early get out so that we can have five minutes while we're studying this great question I want to bring before them this afternoon. It's a question, ladies and gentlemen, that you have to make up your mind on in the next three or four years. I think it's nothing but right that I should anticipate anything that may come across your path in the future to let you know what is necessary to reach the highest, really the highest success in the great crusade that we've begun. So I want to speak to you just a little bit upon that well-known incident that you have heard so often, especially from the lips of Jerry McGear, the money changers in the temple. There are three accounts of the incident of Christ driving the money changers out of the temple in the Bible. Three accounts. The first one is in the 21st chapter of Matthew. The second one is in the 11th chapter of Mark. And the third one is in the second chapter of the Gospel of St. John. When you investigate these three accounts carefully, you will find that Christ on two occasions drove them out of the temple. It wasn't only once he did it, but he did it twice. That is to say, they got back in after the first time, and he had to do it over again. Now, that may be the very thing that happens to us 
and so you'll have to be ready for it. In the second chapter of John, you had the first account of him driving the money changers out of the temple. That was very early in the life of the ministry of the Christ of Calvary. He had just begun his ministry. He went down to the temple and he saw these men, money changers, in the temple, and he took a whip of small cords and drove them all out. And then he made this significant statement that I want you to get, for it seems to me it's perfectly in line with how you feel today. He said, the zeal of thine house has eaten me up. Do you understand what he means? The zeal of thine house has eaten me up. He was so displeased, so put out, that human beings could bring their crookedness right into the very place where God was worshipped, that he couldn't withhold himself or constrain himself, so he took the whip of cords and drove the last of them up and wouldn't allow them to stay there while he was there. The other two accounts, Matthew 21 and Mark 11, it gave you the description of the second time he drove them out. And that was in the last part of his ministry, just before he was crucified. In that uh, time, on that occasion, he gave utterance to these words. I'm reading the 17th verse of the 11th chapter of Mark. My house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer. But ye have made it a den of thieves. My house shall be called by, of all nations, a house of prayer. But ye have made it a den of thieves. Now, uh, it's to this incident I want to call your attention. Not the early one in his life, but to the one that you'll have to face later on. You are already manifesting a zeal that is eating you up. You're so determined that the money changers shall cease their exploitation of the unfortunate people that you'll assemble in large crowds today. But listen to me. The time is coming when you'll have to face the statement of Christ in this verse. My house shall be called a house of prayer. Of all nations shall be called a house of prayer. Ye have made it a den of thieves. Let me read the context for you. Beginning at the 15th verse. And they come to Jerusalem. Jesus went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple. And overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold dust. Would not suffer that any man should carry any vessel through the temple. He taught, saying unto them, Is it not written? My house shall be called, of all nations, the house of prayer. But ye have made it a den of thieves. And the scribes and the chief priests heard it, and thought how they might destroy him, for they feared him, because all the people was astonished at his doctrine. Please note that last verse. The scribes and the chief priests heard it, and thought how they might destroy him, for they feared because he, all the people, was astonished at his doctrine. If you social creditors have made up your mind that you're going to demand uh, square dealing, fair treatment, and reasonable consideration, you have thereby called upon yourself the bitterness and hatred of the money changers, assisted and abetted by certain leaders of the hypocritical nature at the head of religion. Bear that in mind. This meant the death of Jesus Christ. This was the thing that led to his final crucifixion. The very fact that he opposed the money changers and they had the support of the religious people of that time. He would, he who would object to the thievery, the exploitation, the extortion, the oppression, the graft of the money changers must bear their fierce, fiercest enmity and oppression which they will swing against you. Listen to me. 
If you persist, you men and women, they're going to do everything in their power to starve you to it. You got it clear? They haven't a soul at all. It's cruel, it's vicious. They'll fire you from any job that you may have if they can do it. They'll close in on your business if you have one and force you into a sale that will mean such a great loss. It'll almost mean your ruin. They will take you and destroy your good name. They will vilify it. They will say all manner of lies against you for the purpose of destroying that which you intend to do. So it's very necessary for us to go forward knowing what we may expect and clinging together one with the other, assuring ourselves that in unity there is strength and in cooperation we can meet the worst under God. Now, you know that history teaches you that. I know it and you know it. Abraham Lincoln was destroyed by the money changers. That's evident if you have studied the history. The Lord Jesus Christ was crucified by the money changers and those that they could urge forward to propaganda uh, put out propaganda to destroy him. I want you to notice then, as we study this, the money changers in the temple. Before going into this, I would like to ask you to note two essential points of the Old Testament. You'll not fully understand the uh, incident of the text until you realize two things in the Old Testament. The first one is the teaching of the Old Testament regarding interest and usury charges. Now, I think you probably have read many of this. If you haven't, I'd like to call your attention this afternoon to two or three passages. I want to read to you first the 23rd chapter of Deuteronomy and the 19th verse. Here's the way it reads. Thou shalt not lend upon usury to thy brother. Usury of money, usury of victuals, usury of anything that is lent upon usury. Thou shalt not lend upon usury to thy brother. That's definite, that's clear and concise. No one needs to miss the meaning of the word. If you want the blessing of Almighty God, if you want the blessing of Almighty God, you must obey his word. 20th verse 10. Unto a stranger thou mayest lend upon usury, but unto thy brother Thou shalt not lend upon usury, that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all that thou settest thine hand in the land, whither thou goest to possess it. God calls the attention of Israel to the fact that if they're going to charge their fellow citizens interest, that they will not be possible to them to have the blessing of Almighty God. Did you notice, I'm sure you did, that we have already hinted to you that the, the interest racket must cease as soon as possible. On your covenant agreement, we put the word interest-free loan. We declared that we would at once proceed to grant at the earliest possible moment interest-free loans to those who are going to do things necessary for the welfare of our people. collecting from your fellow man that which you cannot pay. See, if I could show you a dollar bill today, if I could pull a dollar bill out before you or a bank note before you, I could say to you without any hesitation, somebody is paying interest on this bill. Now, since no bill leaves the bank money changers without interest being paid, all bills must have interest paid on them. How in the world can any people pay interest when there's no money to pay it with? The only way you can pay interest is to take it off your fellow man and give it to the money exchange. And then your fellow man remains in debt. That's why you have your debts today. That's why they're going that way. You must be prepared in the future. I know it'll take a few years. I know it will. And we're not going to rush you faster than you can go. We have to be patient. We've got to work this thing out. But the day is coming when if you wish to preserve 
a community in peace and, and contentment of respectable, God-fearing people, you'll have to cease collecting interest one from the other. What do you want interest for anyway? If you have your food, clothing, and shelter provided for you, what more should a man want? Now that's the point we're coming to. It's rather interesting to watch the story down the Old Testament. King Solomon was the wisest of men. I'm skipping over all the different points we might take because I do not wish to change you. King Solomon was the wisest of men. And when King Solomon got to that state of riches, where he had so much he didn't know what to do with his gold, he did that that caused him a great deal of distress. I think he must have known it, for he was a wise man. I think probably he was aping the arrogance of the other governments around him, the other rulers around him. For he demonetized silver. He no longer allowed silver in his kingdom to be used as money. And when he did that, he immediately brought distress on the people. For the volume of money was at me immediately cut almost in half. And people wanted money, they borrowed it. And the money changers immediately had a great business. And the money interest rates ran up and up and up. And the people couldn't pay the interest charge. They became in debt. And they're the same thing that you have. Exactly the same thing as you have. Get rid of your families and your children in the bondage of a debt that they never will pay. And never pay if you go on like you are, borrowing money. They were in that state. And it led to the rebellion of Jeroboam. The whole story is written in the pages of Scripture. The people couldn't stand it, and they foolishly followed of Jeroboam. And they fought with bullets and not with ballots. They couldn't in those days. You have changed it. Now, Jeroboam's revolution caused the prophet Ezekiel to make some very strange and definite statements. In fact, so definite that it's strikingly moderate. The 22nd chapter of Ezekiel, beginning with the 12th verse, I read this. In thee have they taken gifts to shed blood. Thou hast taken usury and increase. Thou hast greedily gained of thy neighbors by extortion, and hast forgotten me, says the Lord God. Behold, therefore, I have smitten my hand at thy dishonest gain which thou hast made, and at thy blood which has been in the midst of thee. And I will scatter thee among the heathen, and disperse thee in the countries, and will consume thy filthiness out of thee. Ezekiel declared to the rulers of Israel that because they had been extortionists and had taken from the people that which they could not afford to pay, that therefore they would be scattered the world over, scattered into every country, here and there persecuted. So I say to you, if we social creditors desire to live and let live, to produce and maintain a happy community of respectable, God-fearing people, citizens, we must as soon as possible banish it, banish interest. You men and women that have mortgages today, be wise, I assure you. Take advice from the Word of God. Go to your mortgage or and say, this interest is more than you can pay. We will reduce that amount to so-and-so. Lower it down so the man has a chance to live. Now, to so-and-so. Lower it down so the man has a chance to live. And supply the food, clothing, and shelter to his people while he tries to give you some return for your investment. You know, you better do that. By and by, we shall have to have no interest. And as long as you hold up strongly, it will necessitate compulsion. We want no compulsion. People must not be compelled in the British country unless they persist in exploiting their neighbor. We cannot allow people to exploit their fellow citizens. They must live and let live. Now the second thing I want to call your attention to. That's the interest thing. 
The second thing I want you to know, before you fully understand the incident of the money changers being driven out of the temple, is the law of the temple worship. In the 30th chapter of Exodus, in the 12th and 13th verses, you read these words. When thou takest the sum of the children of Israel after their number, then shall they give every man a ransom for his soul unto the Lord. When thou numberest them, that there be no plague among them, when thou numberest them. Now listen to the 13th verse. This they shall give. Every one that passeth among them that are numbered half a shekel, shekel after the shekel of the sanctuary. A shekel is twenty gerahs. A half shekel shall be the offering of the Lord. You see, do you, that the 30th chapter of Exodus says that there was a special coin made particularly of a half a shekel, ten gerahs, a half a shekel in value that was only to be brought into the temple for the paying of the tithes that were to be offered. Now, it's true that there were other coins in the country, but those other coins would not be received in the temple. There was only the one coin called the half shekel, or the half shekel of the sanctuary, and they had to bring that. Now, do not forget that all true God-fearing people in those days had to bring that little half shekel. They had to get it. And so it, was very, it wasn't very long after the law was discovered before some unscrupulous crook, a rascal, saw a way of exploiting the people. He uh, saw that if he could get a monopoly of the half shekels, he could make the people pay for them whatever he wanted. It was a more scientific way of stealing off the collection plate. You see? And we would despise the man who would pick up a collection plate in the church or in the temple pass it to his fellow men, and when he got to, put his left hand on and take a handful out for himself. But these people didn't have to do it that way. They got the monopoly on the half shekel. I suppose they went to the priest and said, now we'll make it worth your while. If you'll turn all those half shekels back to us when they're contributed, we'll give you other coins that'll buy what you need, and you let us have the half shekel. And I suppose for a split, they got it, and they became a monopolist of the half shekel. You couldn't go into the temple if you'd been a true servant of Israel. You couldn't go into the temple without going to the money changer. And he said, I want so much for a half shekel. You could grumble all you like. He'd say, that's my price. I have them all. You've got to pay me or do with us. And rather than miss your worship of a living God, these exploiters at the gate of the temple refuse to sell these to the people except at their price. Now, do you understand? When Jesus came to the temple in his youthful the exuberance and saw that crookedness right inside the temple where he broke loose and grabbed a few cords and drove them out just like you feel today. But this is the later time and he's coming up now to deal with them. They set up this wonderful monopoly. It barely became a hold-up scheme. You understand now what he means by saying, you've made it a den of thieves. I have no doubt that they urged the priests to preach loudly the necessity of attending the temple worship. I haven't any doubt at all that the priests imposed very strongly onto the people that they should bring in their tithes into the storehouse of God, and I haven't any doubt at all that these money changers themselves would put on their high plug hats and their long coats and sit in the front pew. Surely they would. They wanted to show a good example. But if anybody went to this and asked them why the law was that there was only to be one coin used, they would have given you a very pained look and say, and said, why ask me? I didn't make the law. Somebody else made the law. I'm just a poor man trying to learn a, a living for myself. And I have a hard time to get along. You better go and ask the lawmakers. If you want to know what they look like, you go down to the bankers some of these days, you ask him the very same question about sound money and the gold standard, and just watch what he says. It'll be interesting for you to ask that question and see how the answer would be given you. Now then, I feel when you have these two points in mind, the point about interest, 
or usury charges, and the method of temple worship of the early days, that you'll have no trouble understanding Christ on this occasion. It was the only occasion in Christ's life that he ever used for. Isn't it peculiar that that should be? It was the only case in Christ's life that he ever used for. He always ruled by love up to that time. But he couldn't make a dent in the hearts or minds of these money changers, and he had to make a definite, forceful action to get them out. So he used the whip of cars. I might say to you, ladies and gentlemen, that it seems to me that can only be the one place in which you people, in your representatives in government, would ever have to use compulsion. You see, in your registration, it's voluntary. You don't need to register unless you like. All the courses of social credit will be purely voluntary. But when it comes to the point of extortion and exploitation and graft and greed and lust, there must be some power that will stop the man that won't listen to reason. And I say it may be necessary for us to use the whip of constitutional authority. I believe that every serious thinking man should realize that the present oppression, exploitation, extortion must be removed. We can never continue to live and let live. Modern society will never continue to stand the strain unless something is done. We have no intention of taking away anybody's wealth. Remember that. But we must have no extortion of your neighbor. They must be allowed to live and to be able to secure the necessities of life with the aid and cooperation of the state. And nobody must interfere with that right to live. Now, I think the state must decide and grant that to its citizens. And that's my purpose in all our directions and all our movements. The citizens must be protected from exploitation. Ladies and gentlemen, I won't keep you a moment longer. If we do what I have suggested alone, we have failed to remedy the cause. We must do more than that. If we simply say to ourselves, now we haven't been in a den of thieves, we've never made anything that we have anything to do with the den of thieves, and leave it like that, you haven't remedied the whole situation. You've only touched the last half of that verse. You, Christ says, my house shall be made, shall be called the house of prayer. But ye have made it a den of thieves. Now you see this. You say, I haven't made it a den of thieves. Okay, what have you made it? What have you made it? Have you made it a place of doubt and skepticism? Are you one of those that say, I can't believe anything? I can't trust anybody. Is that what you've come to? Have you made it a house of debt and skepticism? Or have you made it a place of so dreary you never want to go there? Is that the way? You never bother the house of prayer. What have you made the house of prayer? And so I turn to you this afternoon and say to you, it's not enough to make it not a day of thieves. You must make God's house a house of prayer. I am so glad to know that so many of our people have for perfect trust in the God of heaven. So many of the people in the province of Alberta have given their hearts to the Christ and are trusting in him for everything. You look to him and you trust in him. But there are some of you that haven't noticed, haven't noticed carefully how definitely this old Bible is in its explanation of prayer. There is such a thing as repeating words and think you're praying. You know how the Pharisees stood? up in the temple and prayed thus, I thank thee, Lord, that I am not like other men are. I do this and I do that and I do the other thing. I give tithes of all that I possess. I worship regularly in the synagogue. I'm not like this poor publican over here. I, I'm not like him. I'm a good living, respectable fellow. And all the words he was saying wasn't reaching any higher than the roof. But the poor old sinner over there in the corner smote himself on his breast and said, God be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus said, that man went down to his house justified rather than the other. Why? They were both praying. What was the difference? One recognized his need of a savior. The other did not. One had somewhat the vision of the Christ. The other had not. If you are praying, Mr. and you haven't yet found the vision of Christ, 
haven't got any idea of what Christ means to you, your prayers are not going any higher than the ceiling of the room in which you are. Remember that. Do you know what Christ himself said? No man cometh to the Father but by me. You can't come to the Father but by Jesus Christ. You can't pray to the Father except in the merit and in the name of Jesus Christ. Christ, over in the book of John, the apostle says, He that acknowledges, he that denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledges the Son hath the Father also. And may I just have this opportunity to speak to this candid audience this afternoon, to say to you, men and women, it's all very nice to try to 